This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening. My name is Dave Bend. I'm a second year MBA at Haas. I'm also one of the co-organizers of this lecture series. I want to welcome you to the final installment of the lecture series for the semester. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Nat Goldhaber. Nat is the managing director of Claremont Creek Ventures. Before founding Claremont Creek Ventures, Nat had a variety of executive positions in technology companies. He was the founding CEO of Kaleida Labs. He was the CEO of Cybergold, which was sold for a small chunk of change to my points. He was also a vice president at Sun Microsystems. Now, Nat's interests do extend beyond technology. At one point, he served as the energy director for the state of Pennsylvania, and he is also a licensed pilot. So please all join me in giving Nat a warm welcome to UC Berkeley. So Haas is starting to feel like home, uh, aside from the fact that I went to this university. However, there used to be a hospital here instead of uh, the Haas building in those days. Um, we, uh, I am a managing director of Claremont Creek Ventures, and uh, let me just say a few words about that. Um, we're a early stage fund. Uh, we look at mostly clean tech uh, and IT applied to healthcare, although we look at a few other things as well. Um, we are distinguished in that we are in Oakland. Um, we're in the East Bay and we're here by design. We wanted to be close to UC Berkeley because as we all know absolutely beyond any shadow of a doubt, UC is a great university and all the rest of venture capital is on Sand Hill Road next to that other university which lost recently, I understand, <coughs> to our team. And, and, it, and it, it, there's essentially no venture capital other than us in the East Bay. Uh, so it seemed absurd that all the good ideas coming out of Stanford had people pounding on doors to fund and there was nothing in the, in the East Bay for uh, the great ideas that come out of Berkeley, out of LBL, uh, <coughs> out of Lawrence Livermore, and if you extend the definition just slightly, uh, that come out of UC Davis. So we set ourselves up here uh, in, in Oakland, um, and there were three of us who were the founders of this little fund, um, and each of us has uh, some common characteristics, uh, which are not necessarily common to most other venture capital funds. Each of us started a company and took it public. Each of us has worked as a vice president or higher in a Fortune 500 company and each of us had previously been in another venture capital fund. So we believed, and you know, time will tell whether we were right or not, that that was a unique set of characteristics. Set of characteristics that enabled us to talk to new entrepreneurs, to rising entrepreneurs, about what it was that we learned when we started the companies that we worked in and then made the transition from those companies working into, in big companies. How is it that we could now be able to talk to young entrepreneurs and share with them the mistakes that we made and have much greater credibility in sharing those mistakes than somebody who has simply done a bunch of case studies? So we thought that that was a nice team, a nice idea. Uh, we put it together. We're in our second fund now. It seems like it was easy to get started, but in fact it wasn't. It was an entrepreneurial exercise in itself. First of all, we had these strange ideas about where we wanted to locate ourselves. Secondly, we like to invest at very, very early stages, earlier than most other venture funds do. Um, so it was a two-year process with 250 meetings with an awful lot of folks who I didn't think really were well poised to be able to determine whether we could be successful or not. The big breakthrough came when we got an introduction to the money managers at the Harvard Management Company. Um, and uh, we had been appropriately forewarned about the characteristics of 
the head guy at Harvard Management Company, that he was very curmudgeonly. Um, and we, we walked in and we were sitting around anticipating being beat up. And the guy walked into the room and he sat down at the head of the table and he said, why should I give you money so that you can participate in the greatest incineration of capital known to man? Nice opening line. So I said, because we're going to make you an obscene amount of money. And he said, right answer. After that, it was just nine more meetings before they gave us money. But once Harvard came on board, it was fairly easy to get other university endowments to give us money. Uh, and we got, uh, and I'm also very pleased to say that we have the University of California as investors in our fund. So that's the history of Claremont Creek. Uh, we, by the way, do hold office hours here at the Haas School. One day a week or so, one of us, one of the three managing directors or one of our associates is here up at the Lester Center uh, holding office hours. If you take a look at the Lester Center uh, uh, flyer, you'll be able to find it. So I wanted to ask a question and then give you my provisional answer. What do you think it is that constitutes entrepreneurship? I think entrepreneurship is something very special, something very precious, something that is essential to the progress of society. I think the entrepreneur is someone who sees something that nobody else has ever seen and who becomes deeply infected with the idea of the creation of this service or this product. And when he or she tells their friends about this idea or this product, the right answer is, is that their friends ought to laugh. What? You want to do what? But with the sheer power and enthusiasm of the entrepreneur working a way to achieve that consuming objective, eventually some friends and family say, oh, well, she's nuts, but I think I'll give her a little money. Then, working day after day, trying to bring it into existence, eventually convinces a venture capitalist to give some money to the process as well, creates a company, and then that idea that caused laughter initially first catches on and then becomes so ubiquitous in society that no one can ever imagine a day when that didn't exist. That is entrepreneurship. Metaphorically, McDonald's was entrepreneurship. Burger King was a copycat. May have been a better copycat, separate issue. I think that the support and the uh, nurturing of entrepreneurs is one of the great opportunities that some of us as, as venture capitalists and those who are in the service industries that help entrepreneurs get a chance to do. And for those of you who are entrepreneurs, remember, if they don't laugh at your idea, it's probably not far out enough. So I'm supposed to talk, I guess, a little bit about what its life is like as an entrepreneur, uh, as a former entrepreneur. Um, so my very first company was called Green Stuff. And that was before green meant what it does today. In those days, it meant mold and slimy things. It was a photographic processing laboratory. Probably very few of you remember that you actually had to use chemicals to make photos at one time. Uh, this was a photo processing laboratory. We set up shop. Uh, our idea was that we would process artsy photographs, including some that were a little off color and maybe wouldn't get processed by the normal processing labs in those days. This was in the mid-1960s. And we set up shop uh, at, uh, believe it or not, at Shakespeare, which still exists down there on Telegraph Avenue. And that was our drop-off and pickup point. That was my first company. Uh, and then we had a company uh, somewhat after that, three years later or so, 
that did trip lights. They were lights that you hooked up to your hi-fi set and they happened, they were fluorescent. So we had very bright lights that would pulse to the bass, the mid-range, and the treble to sell to uh, the fraternities around the UC Berkeley area. Uh, then I spent a, a, a fair number of years uh, working uh, in teaching meditation. Uh, I met Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in 1965 in Rishikesh, India, and he told me to go back to Berkeley and start a chapter here at the university, which I did, and I was the first president of the uh, Students' International Meditation Society, and it's hard to imagine now, but tens of thousands of students and other people in the UC area, in the, in the Berkeley area, started meditation back in those days. Uh, right after the Beatles started in 1967, I remember that the lines went around the block twice. There were thousands of people who wanted to start meditation. It was a very, very exciting time from that perspective. I did that for a number of years, and then uh, I, I uh, decided that it would be an interesting thing to start a TM university. So I set up the university, which now still exists uh, and is accredited uh, in Fairfield, Iowa. Uh, and uh, that was my, I suppose those things were somewhat entrepreneurial, although I didn't make any money on them. Um, uh, after that, I came back and, and got my master's degree here at Berkeley in education. Um, and then uh, I, I got invited to, um, by a, a good friend of mine, uh, to come back to Pennsylvania because he was going stir crazy riding around in his car. He was campaigning for lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania. Um, and he won. Um, and all of a sudden I was back in Pennsylvania as his assistant and it turned out through some strange idiosyncrasies of Pennsylvania history that the lieutenant governor was in fact in charge of the energy agency. So there was no one running it at that time and he said, Nat, why don't you go effectively be secretary of energy? So at 31, I became the secretary of energy of Pennsylvania, and three months later, the Three Mile Island accident happened. Um, if you don't remember what that was, it was a small nuclear event uh, that happened uh, right next to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which was where I was living. In fact, it was three miles from my house. Uh, so three miles, three months, nice set of threes. Um, so uh, that was exciting, um, and I did that for uh, a few years. Uh, I decided that it wasn't all that interesting uh, being in politics after that period, uh, and I decided to start my first company. So I remembered something my father had told me back in the mid-60s. He said, son, I have one word for you, and that's computers. He said, I'm a physicist. He was a physicist here at the university, still is actually. Uh, and he said, I can't do physics without a computer. Nobody will be able to do anything without a computer in 10 years. Well, he was off by a decade and a half, but he was right. And so I decided to start a computer company, and that company turned into a company that was called Tops. Tops was a local area networking company. And uh, it, it was a company that, uh, that we had conceived and then whose idea evolved around basically taking microcomputers, linking them together, for an office environment. Now, it's hard to imagine this, but that really didn't exist. There were some very crude attempts at it. There were some very complicated ways of doing it, but it didn't exist in those days. Um, and so we took uh, uh, the old CPM operating system, probably none of you remember that, but it ran on a little processor called a Z80, and there were several companies making CPM, including a Osborne, a Berkeley company that made a CPM machine. And we made a local area networking system for it, uh, and, uh, and, and, but we did more than that. We, we looked around and noticed that there were a whole lot of different operating systems out there. There was the Apple II operating system. Uh, there was the uh, Trash 80, as we used to call it, the TRS-80 Model 1, which was the machine that was offered by Tandy, by Radio Shack. Uh, and there were other CPM machines in those days. And, and, and there were also other operating systems out there, such as Unix. And we decided that we'd build a local area networking system where you could hook all these different computers up, they could communicate with each other, transmit files back and forth, 
uh, and, and, and each computer would think of the other computers as being part of their own uh, operating, so their own disk operating system. So when you're on a Mac, a PC looked like a, like a Mac. When you're on a PC, a CPM machine looked like uh, it was part of the, the DOS environment. And I remember I, I sent a, a letter to a friend of mine who was a, a bigwig at Siemens who said, you can't possibly imagine starting another, uh, another networking system. There's so many of them already, it's impossible to break into that. Well, it worked. Um, we started out mostly selling to the Macintosh community. The Mac was relatively new then. And we outsold Apple's own networking system roughly 1,000 to 1. Um, and in addition to that, we hooked up other kinds of uh, microcomputers and mini computers, including Sun Microsystems computers. And Sun Microsystems came along and bought us uh, in 1987. Uh, I became a vice president at Sun, um, and I did that for uh, about a year. Then the venture capitalists who had invested in my company invited me to join their team, uh, and I became a venture capitalist with them. Uh, one of the companies who, which you may know that we invested in is called Macromedia. We were the first money into that. In fact, we brought the entrepreneur who started Macromedia out from Chicago, where he was known as the singing cab driver. Uh, it turns out he'd studied opera and used to drive a cab to make money, but he'd built this little product that did video animation on the Macintosh. And I said, boy, that's cool. Someday people will be using computers for entertainment. Why don't you come out and we'll try and build that kind of company. So we brought him out here. Um, he was a, 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 an irascible and unusual guy, uh, but, but also a delight. Um, and we helped him realize that dream. And now every one of those computers you've got in front of you has that product or its der derivatives running on it. Um, then, um, after uh, being part of that venture capital fund for a couple of years, um, I kind of got the bug again. My partners went off to this crazy company that couldn't possibly make it in Washington called AOL, uh, where they both made a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I stayed behind and, and had a kind of a, a, a nutty idea. I thought that it would be possible to take small amounts of data and translate them back and forth over a, some sort of a system. Um, I thought maybe the cable system would be the way to do it, that bi-directional cable was just being talked about by the cable companies in those days. And that you ought to be able to build a box that had lots of intelligence locally and then transmit a very small amount of information back and forth to bring about big changes locally. And I thought that we would you know, make this into an entertainment and an information device where you could have this, this lookup system to look for information that existed out there in the world. Um, and I tried to build that. I called it the gizmo. Um, and, um, and I went and, and pitched John Scully at Apple. This was in the period right after Jobs had gotten fired. Um, and I said, well, you know, he had, uh, as you may or may not know, he had been at Pepsi Cola before he went to Apple. And Steve Jobs got him to come to Apple by saying, selling soda water to children is a stupid idea. So I said, the only thing that's more stupid than selling soda water to children is selling computers to businesses. Why don't we do something really interesting? Uh, and he said, OK, uh, go write up a business plan. Just about then, Apple and IBM were having a bizarre mating dance uh, and uh, ended up uh, actually trying to create a joint venture. And I said, I have a good idea. Let's turn that joint venture into this idea to build the gizmo. Uh, and Scully said, OK. Uh, and after uh, a bunch of interview processes and having written the business plan, uh, I got the job of, of running Kaleida Labs, as it became called. Um, and there we tried to build the operating system. Really, essentially, what we were trying to build was Java, but we didn't quite know it. Interestingly enough, at the same time, uh, Sun Microsystems was trying to build Java, and they didn't know it either. Uh, they thought they were building a set-top box operating system. Uh, we thought we were building something like a set-top op uh, box operating system that also ran on computers. Um, so there was a lot of parallel development there. Uh, the difference between what happened to the stuff that we built and Java was a woman named Kim Polisi, uh, whose name you may well know. Uh, and Kim saw that this was really a valuable tool. She completely repurposed it and made it into what Java is today after, of course, it's evolved since then. But that was her idea. 
never would have happened without her. She was a low-level product manager at Sun Microsystems, and she created, basically created Java. Um, so after uh, about a year of running Kaleida, it became completely clear to me that it was not possible uh, to, uh, to do anything interesting with IBM and Apple as our parent companies. There were two reasons. First of all, they would not really allow me to give any stock to my employees. They said, well, you can have this phantom stock, and when the time comes, the board will decide what it's worth. Great. Uh, likely that they would not have decided favorably had Kaleida been a success. So I said, now nah, time for me to go, um, and I left. Uh, I left Kaleida. Um, and um, then, uh, then uh, there was a period of a, a few years where I didn't do anything because I needed to recuperate from Kaleida. I guess life is an entrepreneur, so let me tell you a little bit about that. I think this is an important lesson. Uh, the Kaleida consisted of employees of IBM and Apple. All those employees, save the engineers who were actually not bad, but all of the non-engineers who I inherited were more concerned with the computer on their desk being new because it was new than because of what they needed it for. They all thought that they should have the corner office, and there was a little bit of a fight between IBM and Apple about how fancy the benefits could possibly be that we passed on to their employees in this new entity, Kaleida. It was a very, very strange non entrepreneurial environment. And I was, I'll tell you, completely a fish out of water. So I had a $20 million budget in the first year. Now you have to adjust that. That was uh, in 1990. That's like maybe a $50 million budget now, let us say. And I had all that money and all those people, uh, and none of them really cared about what they were doing. They didn't have the fire in the belly. So I tried to get them enthusiastic, and I had pep talks, and I created uh, fancy environments for them to participate in, and I called in outside, uh, uh, in, what are those things called, those people called it, to facilitators, to, to help with trying to invigorate those people, and, and nothing worked. It absolutely flat out didn't work. And so I said, well, then I'm gonna have to lead by example. So I started coming in earlier in the morning and leaving later at night than anybody else. And in addition to that, not sleeping, being there earlier, and getting in later, I also had to take a trip to Japan once a month to meet with potential Japanese partners and to Europe once a quarter. And I don't know, going to New York was just like taking a drive in the car. So I got really tired. Uh, I mean, I actually got to the point where I'd get off the plane and I'd start swooning. That's not a good thing to do. My children at the time, I have triplet boys, were uh, five or so, four or five. I managed to make it home unless I was out of the country on every weekend. And no matter what, no matter where I was, with a room full of cigarette smoking Japanese executives or uh, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a bar in New York, I would leave and call home and read my boys a good night story. But it really just about, I think another year of that might have done me in. It was a terrible experience. And the terrible part of it was not because it was an IBM and Apple. It was because we had a fundamentally non-entrepreneurial environment, and I didn't know how to run it. Maybe somebody could have, but I didn't know how to run it, because I expected everybody had the same motivation that I did, and they didn't. So I, a couple of years of recuperation after that, um, I, um, I started my next company. That company was called Cybergold. Um, Cybergold was a real classic get bit by an idea entrepreneurial uh, environment. I, I started to think about what it meant to have essentially a frictionless way to distribute information back and forth between human beings and how the traditional publishing environment related to that. And I came to the conclusion that what was important, what was valued 
amongst people and in their interactions was attention. People want your attention. Advertisers want your attention. And you, in turn, are interested in things that you're interested in because you would like to pay attention to them. And I had the idea that you could actually build effectively an online economy related to attention. If people wanted your attention, they would pay you with an online currency for your attention. And when you wanted to pay attention to something, you would take that online currency and use it to buy something, to buy content. And so, and who would pay for all this? Well, the very same people who are paying for it now, advertisers. Except advertisers wouldn't pay publishers to publish your material. Instead, advertisers would pay you to pay attention to their ads, and you would then use that to buy whatever you wanted. That was the idea. Wacky, I admit. Um, I thought it was cool. And I was completely consumed by it and built a whole company around that. And when we started the company, that's what we were headed towards. I mean, I wouldn't hear about anything else. But then we started to realize that it might also be important to make money. And so we started actually doing online advertising, early email campaigning, uh, and other things, which we did pretty well at. Uh, we were able to take the company public in 1999. Of course, it didn't take that much to go public in 1999. If you had a business and, a, and you were breathing, you were worth at least $10 million. If you were breathing hard, you were worth 20. Uh, and if there were a few of you breathing together, you could easily get a value of several hundred million dollars for your company. So we went public in 1999. Uh, and after a couple of years, we merged with a company that came right out of Haas here at Berkeley uh, called MyPoints. And then, happily, we sold the entire uh, aggregate company to United Airlines for cash three months before 9-11. So we were, um, we were very lucky to have gotten out with cash when we did. Um, then uh, after Cybergold, something extremely odd happened. A friend of mine who had been solicited to run who was, who was a, a candidate for the Natural Law Party for the Presidency of the United States, was solicited by the Reform Party to come and also run as the Reform Party candidate for President of the United States. Now, those of you who are a little bit younger, the Reform Party was uh, something that was started by a guy named Ross Perot, who ran for president. And had he not had a meltdown, he might well have been president. Uh, in, in, instead of, a, instead of uh, a Bill Clinton. Um, but uh, anyhow, my friend was at, at, and I'd never been to a political convention in my whole life, so I said, well, that'll be fun. So the very day that I sold my company, I literally turned over the keys to the washroom to the new CEO of my points. Uh, I got on my plane and flew down to Long Beach where the convention was going on. And three days later, I was the vice presidential candidate uh, for the Reform Party and the Natural Law Party for the United States. Uh, if, if ever you happen to see that movie called, oh, God, what was it called? The one about hanging chads in Florida. Um, it's, on a, it's an HBO movie. But it comes up, and they show the ballot in Florida. We were on the ballot in 42 states. And my name is right there, very prominent, very amusing to see it. Um, anyhow, that was a kick. Flew around the country, ran for vice president. Um, and then, I, I, you know, I, by the way, I didn't win. I don't know if you know that. Uh, um, maybe I should have, uh, given what happened uh, since George won. Um, it was interesting, I got to tell you this. It was interesting. Uh, in Florida, we were watching the election returns. In Florida, the absolute number of votes that they claimed we had received declined through the evening. It didn't go up, it went down. So we had about 1% of the vote, or maybe 3 quarters of a percent of the vote in Florida, and it continued to go down through the, in absolute numbers. It was 100,000 votes or something like that. It went down through the rest of the evening, which meant, well, you can decide what it meant, but it, it was true. Um, I actually do have an explanation for it, which I'll tell you some other time, but it, it was not probably completely illegitimate, but it was bizarre. 
And then, uh, and then uh, so after that, uh, we decided to start a venture capital fund. Um, and uh, my former um, chief financial officer of the public company and, of, and later on of, of, uh, of my points uh, and I and one other guy uh, got together uh, and started a venture capital fund. The original, original idea was to start a venture capital fund associated with an angel group called the Koretsu Forum. But we went out and started to market that idea and everybody said, you want to do what? This was not an entrepreneurial <laughs> I it wasn't like I wasn't that passionate about it. Uh, they said, you don't want to do that. Uh, the angels don't know what they're doing, and what are you going to do funding angel companies? Not quite true in all instances, but a little bit. So we started Claremont Creek Ventures about five years ago, uh, and we're here in Oakland trying to help young entrepreneurs and middle-aged entrepreneurs, even old entrepreneurs occasionally, realize their dreams and really make a change in society and for the world. So that's my quick two cent history uh, of my entrepreneurial and venture capital experience. Uh, I have no idea what other people who have sat up here have done before, but um, this is the first time I've ever given a speech without a slideshow, at least in the last 20 years. It's interesting. Um, so I, I'd be very happy to open it up to any questions that you might have. Up here. Um, do you think there's ever going to be another bubble burst uh, in the technology sector, um, I guess within the next decade or so? And if so, what, what would you look out for um, in that case? A bubble burst? Well, IT technology. Do you mean a burst or you mean the reverse? Do you think, will there be another bubble? I don't think well, we have a bubble at the moment. Will there be another bubble, do you think? I, you know, I think there may be a kind of mini bubble associated with, uh, with the enthusiasm for green tech. Um, and there may be some stuff that's pretty silly that's getting funded uh, these days and maybe occasionally a too high evaluation. But I have to say that the most recent recession has taken a lot of the kind of over-enthusiasm out of the equation. Uh, and from my perspective, it's been a good period because an awful lot of bad venture capital funds have gone out of business who were not doing any good to anybody. Um, and so uh, there's less competition for deals, uh, and entrepreneurs are much more serious now than they were a few years ago. So I don't see a bubble in the, I'm, I mean, you tell me what the economy is going to do, and I'll tell you whether there'll be a bubble. Uh, if we see a huge resurgence of the economy, if IPOs become easy to get once again, if M&A transactions really step up again back to where they were a few years ago, I imagine we could see a bubble. And if I were to predict, I would say it would be in the area of, of clean tech. Uh, it, but at the moment, I don't think it's happening. Hi. What kind of clean tech companies are you guys investing in? What sector specifically? We're, we're a small fund. Um, so we're, we're I mean, let me give you a definition of what small is these days. It's, we're, we're $300 million under management. So that's a, it's not a tiny fund, but you know, when, when many of my friends have billion dollar funds, I sometimes feel inadequate. Um, the, uh, the, the, so by definition, we have to invest in early stage stuff and we have to invest in capital efficient stuff. And the only area of true capital efficiency in clean tech, or one of the principal areas, is in energy conservation. Uh, you don't need to spend five years building some kind of slime that you can put in your diesel truck, which is very expensive, uh, very capital intensive. Uh, you don't need to build huge plants for solar collectors and so on. But instead, you can build a device that goes in the home that allows you to save energy or some sort of a communications mechanism to save energy, much more capital efficient. That's the kind of stuff that we're investing in in clean tech. Another company that came right out of Haas uh, is one of ours. It's uh, Adura Technology. So Adura was founded by a, a professor uh, in, the, uh, in the School of Architecture and two Haas two Haas graduate students, and they, uh, they created this company, which I think is really a fantastic company. It won the Clean Tech Open 
uh, and then it, it won the Cleantech Open a second time as the best alumni company. Uh, they, they do uh, energy management of lighting. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you in, a, in a room, in a building that has uh, asbestos in the ceiling, how do you turn off individual lights without rewiring everything through a wireless mesh network? Anybody else? So the question is, has the current economic situation changed anything that our LPs do or the way in which we make investments? Um, the answer is generally no and yes. Um, our LPs have remained completely faithful. In fact, 100% of the LPs who were in fund number one came into fund number two, which closed after the crisis began. Um, <clears throat> the, there, one of our LPs had a little bit of economic problem. Uh, and asked if they could sell part of their commitment to somebody else, which we did. Uh, but generally speaking, our LPs have been just fine. They, of course, really are in trouble. I mean, you know, Harvard Management Company, I think, is down 30 percent. Of course, if you go back another 10 years, they're up uh, still 100 or 200 percent over where they were then. So they've done very well uh, over a couple of decades. But in the immediate term, they're down. Uh, but they have, they have kept up their commitments, and they seem to be happy with us. Um, and so too, m almost all of our investors uh, are university endowments. Um, at, at, with the ex we have two pension funds and, and one nonprofit organization endowment, and that's, that's our LP pool. Um, has it made a difference to us in the way in which we invest? I think the answer is yes. Um, and part of the reason is that because of the down economy, the amount of time that's required to get to profitability or even to, you know, to break even uh, and, and then to find liquidity has greatly expanded. And the number of venture capital funds are de is definitely down. The consequence of which is that we have to stick with companies that we invest in for a much longer period of time, uh, more than we anticipated. So we thought it was going to take five years initially. It's probably more like six on average, but that means there's some outliers there too. Um, and so what we do is we now almost insist on finding a co-investor when we first go into a company. We did not do that originally. We were willing to go in by ourselves and either hope that somebody came along later or just expect to hold till a B round. The other thing is, is that B rounds, it's getting a little bit better, but a year ago there were no B rounds, absolutely none. Uh, I'm exaggerating, of course. but. I define a B round as that round that is required to take a company that has proven its technology or its service but has not yet really hit market to the next stage of market expansion and then finally the C round to take it all the way up the hockey stick. Um, the B round just disappeared. So venture capital funds insisted that they saw market traction of significance before they came in for a second round may have been called a B round, but it clearly is what was a C round previously. So now that means if we make an investment, we need to anticipate holding the company until what conventionally would have been thought of as a C round. The good news is that there are less venture capitalists. It really is good news. Uh, it's, it's not just that, uh, it, there were a lot of, you know, I, I, I call them the white shoe entrepreneurs. Um, that, that's, that was this phenomenon. There used to be a, a great computer conference in, uh, in Las Vegas um, called um, Comdex. Uh, and it disappeared off the face of the earth a few years ago. But Comdex was a place where you really saw great engineers and enthusiastic young entrepreneurs dressed more or less like I am uh, and, uh, out there you know, selling their wares. And over time, it transitioned. And you could see sort of the used car salesman syndrome beginning to emerge where people started to come in looking much fancier with, with, and with white shoes. Uh, and so the white shoe syndrome really happened in, in venture capital. Uh, venture capital was a very successful asset class for a while, which for those of you who don't know what that means, the engineers amongst us, uh, it, means, it means a place to put your money. Uh, and that asset class, um, that asset class uh, became something that a lot of folks who shouldn't ever have been venture capitalists started to do. People who were, uh, as Mitch Kapor used to define the guy who took over Lotus after him, he was like a conductor who was tone deaf. 
So they had all the right accoutrement, but they didn't have any of the sense of how to do it properly. And those people have, are, are disappearing. They're not getting refunded. Um, and so there's a much more rational marketplace for the emergence of great entrepreneurs. And I think the venture capitalists who still persist are much better venture capitalists. Those who are willing to go in and help the entrepreneur realize his or her dreams. <laughs> yes, again. How many business plans or pitches do I see a week? Uh, so it, it, it's lumpy. It varies from week to week. But there have been weeks where I saw as many as two or three a day. Uh, if you don't include the ones that sort of came in over the transom um, that, that were just sort of emailed to me, which I try not to look at uh, if I can avoid it. Um, so I, ones that actually rose to a level of interest where I said, you better come in and tell us more about it. Um, and then there are weeks where I probably only look at one. Um, so it's quite, it's quite lumpy. Th this has been a very, very, very brisk time for venture capital in the last, for me uh, and for my fund, in the, last, uh, in the last three or four months. There's a lot of really great ideas that we're seeing these days, um, really, really meritorious ideas. Um, and so. Uh, it, you know, when you see one of those and you read, you know, you read the, the executive summary and it looks like something really coherent, it, you, you want to look at it. So it's been busy. Yeah. So two separate questions. Number one, what do we do with the ideas that we don't invest in? Uh, and number two, what do we do with the ideas that are really good ideas that we, we're just not the right fund for? Like, for example, one that takes more money than we would be able to put up. Um, we, we refer them to other venture. The, 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 the ones that we don't want to fund and we don't think are good ideas, yeah, you know, we, we give the entrepreneur their, their business plan back or we erase it off the hard disk. Uh, the ones which are really good ideas, we, we do turn over to other VCs um, that, that, are, that are just not right for us. And we hope that they do the same for us, by the way. I mean, some of the very big funds, you take a, take a fund like a Vantage Point, for example, although they do make a few early stage investments, they've got billions of dollars under management. They can't really afford to be an early stage fund. There's a limited number of human beings who work there. Uh, and they can't afford to work in investments that are two or $3 million. They have to put $20 million or $30 million or $50 million to work in a single investment in order to justify the time that they devote to it and also to be able to make the returns that are expected uh, by their investors. So, uh, so we turn over some of the later stage stuff or stuff that's going to require more, more money to funds like them, and they turn over some to us, hopefully, when they've seen something they thought was really cool, but it was too small. We're out of time. Please join me in thanking Nat once again for his time.